Welcome in. Welcome all. Nice to see you here. So we are just a first uh, a notice. The, uh, uh, the proceedings today will be directly transmitted on uh, YouTube. We are recording the proceedings as well and they will be made publicly available after the event. All the speakers have agreed to this. Uh, no cameras are pointed in your direction, so you, you, you know that as far as I know. So we are here to discuss uh, cultural heritage and uh, and. Uh, it's uh, within a project that we are working on uh, called DAGE, which stands for Digital Action on Climate Change, you know, among many other things, looking at the use of uh, extended reality in uh, communicating and researching cultural heritage in a kind of a new climate situation that we are in. But not more about that. We have four speakers with us today. With us today, uh, our kind of main speaker, no offense to the other speakers, our main speaker is uh, Eric Champion, who's come all the way from Down Under. He made it on a plane yesterday from the UK, you know, one of the few planes that actually managed to land in, in, in Iceland yesterday, and we are very, very happy he did. 
This morning he had a, a workshop with, uh, with a number of participants on uh, how to design a game based on uh, a kind of around cultural heritage and it was great fun. You know, both Skule and I participated in this um, and if you have an opportunity to do this at some time, I, I, this is replaced by Hela, so uh, she's sitting over there. Uh, but otherwise these are our speakers, Eric Champion, Heida, Thruster Thor and uh, Sunna. This is the agenda. We aim to finish around four. Um, we'll kind of finish this with a, a, a general discussion or, or you know, Q&A. Uh, I'm not sure we go into a formal uh, panel in the end. Um, but you know, let that be enough as an introduction. So Eric uh, and virtual tourism and let me know find your slides. So, Eric. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yes, yesterday we waited a whole day to get on the plane and then we found out the windscreen wiper didn't work. So, I'm very lucky to be here. And I've never been in Iceland before. So it's a great honor to be here. I'm sorry I'm only here for a few days. Um, I will try and be extremely prompt. We have a lot to get through this uh, because I've had lots of good Icelandic coffee today. <laughs> Please interrupt me. And I am originally a New Zealander from a Danish town, from a, a lost prime minister. That explains the name. Um, so anyway, on, onwards with this talk. So, I have been um, an academic for some years, and before that I worked in IT, and I've been involved on the edge of game design as an amateur for about oh, 40 years. Um, so I'm very fascinated by games, but I'm even more fascinated not just by the playing of games, but how people design them. I love watching people play games, I love watching people design games for other people. And I'm moving from my games because I believe, having taught game design on and off for 20 odd years, that people actually learn more from designing them and, from, and explain my particular interest, which is in cultural heritage, digital cultural heritage, and the 3D, because I trained originally in architecture, but I have been corrupted by the humanities for some time, and I'm going to explain how I corrupt multimedia and IT students to do digital humanities, perhaps without realizing it. Um, I was for four years as well a UNESCO chair, which uh, might sound impressive, but really the university puts you forward, you get peers to vote you in, and then you spend four years on your own trying to work out how to do whatever the mission of your chair or your network okay. is. And, uh, and, and the, um, the advantage though is you get invited to Paris once every four years where they will pay you lunch. <laughs> it's not quite so tempting in Australia, but it was still, it's still amazing to meet other UNESCO chairs. And you meet people, for example, who are in their towns, one third doesn't know about the heritage, one third does know about the heritage and doesn't want anything to remember it by, and one third who does. So the, the politics, the conflicts, and the social issues, I, I find fascinating. But I also find fascinating is how when I started my PhD, which was with, funded through Lonely Planet, in those days, uh, people wanted you to do virtual environments. This is around 20 odd years ago. But when you look at the most successful virtual environments, they tend to be simulations, military exercises, and games. Right? So I became very interested in why. And I, then I also worked for Daria and Dickham Lab. Well, my job was Dickham Lab, but I worked for VU Networks about 12 years ago. And it seemed to me we have a lot of repositories and scholars, and archives, and so forth, but very little in the humanities and how we interact between us. And there was a scholar, was it? A, a dean of a famous university, I won't name it, but she said in a meeting, Edison is amazing as a humanities person, we now have a million books. Oh. And I, well, I agree, but um, I, I stupidly said, um, well, isn't it more important that we have a million readers instantaneously? So, so to me, one of the interesting things about humanities, it depends on your field, of course, I came from architecture and philosophy, but we weren't really designed to handle people in real time in, in, that, in that scale but also in terms of how interactive and immersive it could be. And this is also related to tourism because one in three or two out of three people when they tour are actually going to cultural heritage sites as well. So how can we link all of these things? 
Um, unfortunately, first I'm going to mention a couple of problems. And I'm going to talk briefly about the vanishing, but, but uh, I will mention that there is a, a publication called The Conversation, which is in some English parts of the world where the academics write to the public. And in my case, down under in Australia, there were two people who wrote about virtual heritage, uh, cult, VR applied to cultural heritage, we'll define it for now. And they, one was a philosopher who said, virtual reality cannot convey the real thing. And the other was an architect who said, virtual reality architecture can't convey atmosphere. And they're mostly right, maybe, but I kind of disagree with them. And I think one of the most interesting things to me, particularly for a philosopher, is why are we trying to convey reality? Couldn't VR convey process, which it's much more about, and how it could imply alternatives and simulations and way things could uh, combine for you to explore alternatives? So I was really quite concerned at that stage about how VR is perceived. Um, and there's, we have a, a parallel issue as well with the museums, and you all know about COVID, but it's beyond just COVID, and it's around the world. The number of people who don't visit, the number of people who don't know about collections, the amount of collections which you can't see. Um, and I'm going to give an example. And because I'm now based in Australia, I'm going to show you a Tibetan archive. A Tibetan archive, sorry, I might have said. So this is a collection of an, um, ancient manuscripts. The sound is incidental, actually. But they don't know what's in it. So they have the physical artifacts, they don't have the money or the resources for most of these manuscripts, these amazing manuscripts. Because just imagine what that museum is like, that archive. And in Australia, we have the same problems. We have archives that are flooded. We have libraries that are facing environmental problems. How do we get people to approach these and understand these and connect these small bits of data, especially when they're digitalized? And my students think when you digitalize something, you've captured it and conveyed it, and it's going to last forever. They don't think about the environmental cost of a the digital. They don't think about the people who actually have to maintain it. And they don't know how to connect them unless they're told how to. So, yeah, goodbye to Tibetan archive for a second. We have also another problem. Um, Fremantle Prison on the right had, was a World Heritage Site, still is. Had a million visitors a year and then none. And we talked to them about putting in mixed reality for ghost stories and escape stories and so forth. But as the museum pointed out, um, their, their main... Uh, feature is actually the human storytelling of the guides and the head who was uh, part of a large museum and developed digital projects for years said they break down we can't train the staff we don't know how to upgrade them and then about two weeks ago I spoke to the South Australian Museum who had developed an escape room years ago and they mentioned one other thing I'd forgotten about they don't have time to even make sure the software is updated so for AR it's a big problem and I can tell you as well in Australia and perhaps also in Iceland, people don't download phone apps. So the last three to five years, museums have done wonderful apps on your phone, but for some reason, people don't want to download the applications. So there is all these issues. And in the end, we didn't work with the, uh, the prison, but they still have these problems of visitors and so forth, and they have these amazing, rich, immersive stories. And I was co-chair of the, the digital heritage theme of ECOMOS, which is the volunteer organization allied to UNESCO to help review heritage sites for world heritage status and so forth. And it was the first time digital heritage was part of ECOMOS. And I'd, I'd proposed it, and then years later they decided to have it, and I co-chaired it. And most of the papers were traditional academic papers. Here is a project. We did well. Let's walk away. And, but one of the few takeaways I, I got from that, apart from the traditional academic circuit, was there was a beginning emerging interest amongst the academics and the institutes about how we combine fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable with care data, which is more about indigenous responsibility, ethics, and co-sharing. But how do we involve that with our digital heritage projects? And from about two decades of my experience of digital virtual heritage projects, and it goes beyond that, we have major issues in even finding these projects, let alone making sure people know how to use them and access them. Um, and uh, I'm always using this slide. Uh, there's another slide which is even better than this, but I'll get in trouble showing it. So I'll talk about this one, which I find fascinating. And I mentioned this last year in the virtual conference, but it's, it's so impressive and daunting in a way. This is the most expensive online virtual heritage project I know of. Uh, IBM collaborated with academics and researchers in China and America. It was $3 million US, I think. Um, 
they used a free uh, game called Talk by Garage Games. With the game company, they modified it to work online. It was like a, an earlier second life. You could be an avatar, you could teleport, etc. Within six months of being online, it disappeared, and I still don't know exactly why. So we have some very expensive white elephants um, which disappear. And so a scholar and I, a research fellow and I, actually went through some of the major conferences three years ago and tried to find the 3D assets, 3D projects, the formats, etc. And if there's, and I would say these are one, two, three, four, five of the most important digital heritage conferences in the world, up until 2019 or so, if there's like 300 plus conference papers on 3D digital heritage, you're lucky to find 30 or 40 references to the 3D. But then if you try and play them, you're lucky to find more than one or two. So I call this the vanishing virtual, it's not my term. So the virtual heritage projects don't even last as long as the heritage projects. And if you look at the repositories as well, the features aren't designed for archeologists, historians and so forth. Um, and I spoke to a, the cultural heritage man at Sketchfab who's just lost his job recently. And he said, well, it is a presentation format. It's not a preservation format. So there's still a big gap between the 3D models, the public and ongoing use and reuse. But I, I said I was going to be positive, and I, uh, this is a 2015 project, not digital at all, uh, that Leeds and other partners ran, and it was about heritage decision making with your community. And they mentioned four themes at the end of this project, and you can read it online. Um, to act, connect, reflect, situate. And I thought, in yellow, there's a digital equivalent to this. So rather than VR as copying reality, VR can simulate reality or potential reality. You can use linked open data to connect across data and collections and viewpoints. And you can use digital technology, and in my case, mixed reality, to see things through other people's eyes. And mixed and augmented reality can also help you see the artifacts in the context of where they used to be or how they used to be used. So I think that um, there's still some wonderful ways we can use digital heritage and then also particularly in the way in which we watch people share it and use it and make meaning from it themselves. And this is a very old project by one man, a volunteer in Brazil. It's apparently the most famous or important Brazilian church of its kind. And it was, it was a major graffiti problem. So what he did was, and this is about 10 years ago, uh, Demetrius Lasset, he had made game engine levels of these churches, but he decided now to create software, very simple software, and teach people to make their own Google VR cardboard boxes. And he taught them how to create videos of the avatars guiding you around the church inside the panoramas of the church. And they weren't programmers, they weren't designers, but they all had cameras, so they could all make this hybrid video panorama system. And that's not the important thing. The important thing is the local community spent so much time making these video panorama guides, there's, nobody had um, the opportunity to make graffiti in the church. So I think this is where I would like to move with these academic projects. Um, and I'll just briefly mention my PhD, which is, I think, looking back, I'm very unusual, uh, very lucky. Excuse me for the fonts changing on this computer. Um, Lonely Planet was the industry partner, and they discovered that they had a virtual tourist in 2000, 2001. People who wanted a book on Afghanistan that was being bombed, obviously not wanting to go there. So it was their most requested book. And so they said to my supervisors in engineering and architecture, we'd like to explore 3D online internet tourism. And I was allowed to choose the technology, the site, and the research questions. So of course I chose ancient Mexican world. Um, and the interesting thing, which I only discovered once I took on this heritage site, was one of the three archaeologists who cracked the Mayan code actually learned how to read it, had gone to Australia in my city. So I was able to talk to him about how we could use a very simple online world to give people an impression of an ancient 1,000-year-old site from the Mayan perspective themselves. Um, so it wasn't designed to be realistic, it was designed to be experiential, and it was designed to see what type of interaction helped them learn the most. And so it was really an evaluation of an evaluation. And I had seven different evaluation methods. But very briefly, I found that the people who performed the tasks the quickest, I usually had 3D or game experience, they remembered and understood the least. So they were focused the most on the game, not on the understanding. And when I showed 80 to 100 archaeology students the prototype, the major questions, and they were studying Mayan, Mayan archaeology, the major questions were, how do I change clothes and how do I find weapons? Yeah. 
And so I thought, well, this is really interesting. And I had these mini games at the end. So if you do tasks, you go to these mini games, which are based in Mayan myths. And because this archaeologist was so wonderful and said, yes, you can use portals, and yes, you can use invisible sky snakes, and so forth, um, they, and we had Mayan music which led them through the world, um, I found that if I told them that they were games, people knew exactly what to do, but they didn't treasure what they were doing. If I told them they were digital archaeological simulations, they treasured what they were um, supposed to be doing, but they didn't know what to do. So games gave them this framework of navigation and interface. Um, but I also found that um, extrapolating cultural understanding was the most important thing to see what they learned. So not asking them subject questions about the site, but seeing if they could extrapolate their knowledge of the Mayans to others. And the final thing I might mention, not but two final things I might mention, um, one is in English language, challenge can mean two things. Uh, difficult and you don't want to do it, i.e. schoolwork, and difficult and you do want to do it, i.e. a game. So it occurred to me then, how can we combine this, this game-like mindset and this understanding of, a, of a, another past, another culture? Um, so I, I'm going to run out of time, so I won't go on to the definitions too much. But one definition in the middle I might suggest is, um, if virtual heritage is VR applied to cultural heritage and it includes games and so forth, what is really important, perhaps, is conveying the cultural significance of that through the site. And in the last 20 years, I've changed it to, we need to convey the culturally significant presence. So I came up with this term, cultural presence. So if we built a recreation of a, another site, and you had avatars and you could go through it, and you understood other people were there, you have social presence. But if they were talking to you about the bus stop timetables in Reykjavik, and you were supposed to be an ancient Roman world, you don't actually have cultural presence. Does it make sense? So I tried to find a definition of culture different to social definitions. And one of the interesting things about culture, A, there's actually a book in the 52 definitions of culture in the English language, but B, culture is a, an object and a verb. And if we look at heritage sites, it's not just creating simulations of heritage sites, it's sharing the meaning of them and preserving the meaning of them. And if you look at virtual worlds of cultural heritage, there's almost never an explanation of care. And the person doesn't have to take on responsibility to the future. So yeah, culture is a difficult, difficult sense. Um, but I, when I came up with this term, I noticed the archaeologists used it slightly differently. And there was a session at the Oxford one, which had to run the year after during COVID. But they, in their session, said most of the VR, AR, XR experiences fall dramatically short of the goal of expressing the importance of past places and things to their original communities, which I agree with. And when I rewrote the book, which was based on my PhD, basically, I noticed that there were many of these issues that were still a problem. I'm just going to give you one, two suggestions. In evaluation, when we're an academic, we tend to evaluate a project, we write about it, we walk away. Why can't we build the evaluation into the project and the audience understands what we've learned? That's one. And secondly, designing a game or a virtual environment and maybe the game designers disagree with me, but especially in VR, designing it without thinking about navigation is a disaster. Because as soon as you put people in a digital environment, they lose all these cues they take for granted in the real world. And, and we have this related term, which is digital literacy, which I often try and talk about digital fluency. So being able to read things and use, use tools is fine, but you need to have fluency across them to make your own meaningful advances. But in a virtual environment, we don't have any definition which talks about the issue of navigating and understanding how other people navigate. So when you talk to, to the game designers who developed the first headset VR, and they used the sunny rules and recommendations, they had to change those rules. They had to stop building games where you jump up and down because people got sick. Right? But if you go backwards in the old VR research, 20 years ago, one of the four factors for engagement in VR was actually negative engagement, which means if people throw up, they're actually engaged. <laughs> of course, we can't do that when we sell headsets and games. So navigation and wayfinding and allowing people to feel that the, the world is around them is so important. I think there's a term, well, you can use a different term, but immersive literacy, and that is understanding how to navigate and orient, orientate around our environment but also as a game designer or a virtual designer, understanding how other people do it. 
Does that make sense? So when I taught game design, when I first started, I had the game design students evaluate each other, and they learned probably more from that evaluation than just from designing their own games. Because when you design a game, it's so easy to think, oh, other people will know exactly how to go through it. But that's because you know how to go through it. Does that make sense? So there's a double-sided element to this which uh, I'm still wrestling with. So we, we could look at games and say, well, why should we teach game design in academic areas? Um, one easy answer is because there's so much money, apparently. Um, but the other answer is, especially for humanities, one starts thinking about how do people interact. And I'm not sure about here, but it, in the universities I was in, in the humanities areas, we're not taught visualization, we're not taught interaction design, we're not taught user experience and evaluation. So if humanities people have all these tools and have all these audiences, maybe the game design is a great way for understanding some of these issues. Sorry, I feel like I'm ranting a bit. Um, in Australia, and I know it's not very applicable, but there was a report just done this year on who plays games and suddenly people realized almost half a female 81% of everybody plays video games, but also a huge majority of our families that share, they share the games between the generations. So there's a real opportunity for cultural heritage to actually have layered information where children and adults and grandparents can share information across these different types of games. Uh, another interesting thing about games, particularly for cultural heritage, is how you can use mechanics to teach people things they take for granted. Um, on the left-hand side, is a game that teaches you through just organizing colored shapes, the, the yellow and the blue, the triangles and the squares, and you have to put them in an order in relationship to the neighbors, but after a while you start realizing that they're discriminating against each other. So it teaches systemic discrimination. On the right-hand side was a, is a at least 20 years old game using, it's a mod of Unreal Level, Unreal Tournament, I think, um, by designers at RMIT and they won an Australian government grant to build this game of a refugee camp in South Australia which is hidden away from the city if you like and I thought it was really interesting because it's not very interactive at all so you are surrounded by these non-playing characters who walk around like zombies and your mission is to find someone who'll help you escape now as soon as they got the grant and built the game and it got publicity the government tried to shut it down and only recently did the game designers say their names. Um, but it's a very powerful effect, this game, using non-interactivity to make a point about what happens to people left in this situation. And of course, and I, I think you'll know more of these examples than I will, um, the ability to work with indigenous companies is, is, is really powerful and never alone is, I think, not just winning BAFTAs and so forth and being spoken indigenous language, but they now own part of the game company. So they could use it to employ their own designers, craftspeople and storytellers, but they can also move into the game industry business. And I've, we're just finishing an edited book on Assassin's Creed, and we were talking to historians and archaeologists who wrote this about how they use it in the classroom. But what I had not realized until last year, or the year before we started it, was a number of museums and galleries using Assassin's Creed as well. And um, it's a very elaborate game, perhaps too elaborate for some, but it's got this amazing discovery tool which raises all sorts of interesting questions about how you promote the paradata or research behind it. And it also has a story creator mode, so you can create your own quest using the material of the game. But then there's a the copyright issue. So there's some very interesting things, but Assassin's Creed is actually, Ubisoft, the game company, has also moved into the escape room business with galleries, libraries, and exhibitions. I said I'd briefly mention technology. Um, I been talking about games, but also games, VR, etc. There's a, a real issue for scholars, and that is that, and these are just a couple of, of headsets that were available over the last five to ten years. People don't know how to use them, and when you see the presentation in the media, they often don't show you how the audience uses them. So we built a simple poster to describe where you are, how you view it, what the features are, what's the relative cost, and we, we had all these equipment. And at that stage, the HoloLens 1 was probably one of the leading ones. But every so often it didn't work with the game engine. Um, it was superseded within, I'd say, two years. And some of the other headsets here were superseded within one year. Well, they didn't work anymore. Um, so it's a real problem with headsets. It's a real problem with data. But it's also a problem with augmented reality. I, I gave 
a workshop to Americans who had taught AR software, um, you know, a funded workshop. A year later, I came back to see the projects, and they had um, half of them had taken a software product, an AR product, which had been bought out by a giant company. The software no longer existed, the company no longer existed, but the worst thing was all their data was online because it was cloud. And so they didn't have their data either. So it was a major issue for them, this reusability. And I said this last year, and I'll briefly mention this again. Uh, another problem with the technology and explaining it to people is when we have too many categories. So the original definition of VR was it was a component of a spectrum of mixed reality. And there were four types in this famous paper from about 30 years ago, including augmented virtuality, which is quite hard to explain to most people. But I guess the best example I'd give would be esports. So everything is computer generated, but it takes one thing from the outside world. So it augments virtuality with reality. And the other issue is that when you explain things like AR, most people have an AR app on their phone, which is not AR, because it layers objects on your phone with the real world behind, but that, that augmented object is supposed to be spatially embedded in the, the real world. So given these two major problems, the number of categories that's confusing and the use of categories, which still confuses, people have started talking about X, um, XR as the overall spectrum. But there's one other thing which sometimes gets lost in this discussion. Extended reality also promises to calibrate for every type of headwear, laptop, etc. that you're doing. So as a designer, you don't need to build a software system for each type of hardware. It just knows, it just works it out. That's the dream anyway. But with these creation tools, like on the, on the left is um, Bolt's AR Snapchat, which transforms city spaces into green spaces. And on the right is the latest Apple on your phone, LiDAR, which creates automatic 3D models and then catalogs them for you in space. I won't go through that horror music. Um, you, you're then allowed to put them into this wonderful, shining, peaceful world called the metaverse. And you've also got AI to help you do these things. In this case, this is actually um, the past and letters from 500 years ago, and all this is completely fake, based on reality or historical reality. Um, so it's a really interesting question. It's a very powerful set of photos or paintings, and it's completely AI generated from statistical sampling. Um, so how would you be able to tell the difference? And, and my issue isn't so much that. My issue is perhaps a lot of these products automatically go on the web, and the architects in my school are doing this already, using AI for design for crematoriums to create memories of, of sample users. How will we in the future know what was AI generated from historical data and what was historical data? Um, and then of course, it will go into this thing, the metaverse. And I think uh, the, the headsets are wonderful. The, the use and explanation of use has not been great. But people on Twitter have pointed out one thing that I think is very good. They've made the headsets cheaper and more powerful and they dominate the headset market. Maybe three quarters of the world is, is Quest owned by Facebook. But they haven't got social sharing yet, which is the problem that destroyed VRML as a format. And, and they're talking about using AI in the creation of this as well. But there's a, a paper on, on it as a problem versus a conversation about AI as an existential threat in terms of allowing us not to make critical judgments. And secondly, the academics have said, this is great. Now we've found that um, the, the normal chat GPT where you type in queries and it creates movies or images, etc., you don't need that. It's much faster and more efficient for the machine to work out what you're looking and asking new questions. And it said the problem with this might be privacy of data. But I think the problem with this is actually, we stop thinking about things, we stop thinking about how we would ask questions. So there's a privacy issue as well, perhaps, especially with biofeedback and how the latest Quest can track your upper body, the headset, which is wonderful from an interaction design point of view, but there's no real conversation yet on who uses this data and for what. So I just, raise these questions, I'm not going to answer them here. And then I'll briefly mention a couple of student projects, even at student level, which relate back to what I started with. Um, we initially developed games based on literature, and one was a Chinese game, Journey to the West, which is known in English circles as Monkey, or Monkey Magic. And the, the English version is a BBC 
voiceover version of a Japanese version of a Chinese story of a monk who goes to India. So it's not completely accurate, right? Um, but the original story is a classic of Chinese literature. And when we built a game on the traditional book, which we had a, a scholar of traditional Mandarin translate it, we found that when we tested the Chinese students, they thought it was wrong because they had the wrong version. So it had been translated through popular culture for so many media and generations, theirs wasn't accurate either. So we had this interesting problem. When you take a literal translation, you might find that the actual popular uh, transference of it doesn't match up. And so a Chinese student came to me, and he was a specialist in calligraphy, and his friend was a master's of traditional Chinese music. And he wanted to recreate Taoism, the books of Taoism, through a game. And what we did was, rather than show it directly and tangibly, we wanted to show, because the books themselves are even hard for Chinese people to understand, how it's different to the way people normally see things. And what he did was take a touchscreen game and using your fingers, you actually have to imitate and show empathy to the relationship between, say, the characters and the seasons through the game of Go, through painting, through calligraphy or music. So I won't have time to show, show it, but it was really interesting that when you give indirect feedback and a, a way in which people can watch people performing, how engaged they get. And I also mentioned that mixed reality can show you different viewpoints. So this was a case of a, a recreation of a 400-year-old boat that went from the Netherlands through Indonesia to Australia. So this is the replica, a floating replica. And they were running out of money. In fact, that boat in our city had to be moved to the other side of the country in order to save it. We developed a project using two hololenses. So in this boat, the Doifkin, inside are actually cannons and cannonballs and the spices that they took from Indonesia. And we built a, a mixed reality map so if you have these two um, hololenses on, um, you see the, the, the story. I'll go back, actually. Oh, no, actually, I don't have another drawing of it. You see a map appear in front of you. You have to take the spices, and the, the, the hololens will recognize it, and it will allow you to do the story across the world over, over 400 years using the actual physical artifacts. But the important thing is not that. The important thing is with the hololens, the two people can see each other and they can see the physical world, but they both see different things on top. And they don't realize initially. So they have to communicate to share the same picture of the world. So mixed reality can allow you to do this. And it has sound and you can control the 3D objects and move them. If you might see sound a little bit, thank you. But what you can also do is use this in museums of artifacts. And this is a... Do you want me to turn it down here? Oh, thank you. The sound is not really important here. Ah, oh, gotcha. oh, and here it doesn't matter because basically the whole lens can actually allow you to move objects and reanimate them. So this is the oldest existing steam engine in the world on a ship that was sunk 100 years ago. And after 30 years, the museum managed to make the steam engine work again. And the artifacts all around this gallery, which is the Shipwrecks Gallery in Perth, Western Australia. And your job is to put the parts together from the museum, and the map will appear, and then the engine will start working. But you can actually ask people to explore the Aboriginal version of it, and it's recorded in rock art, or the European version of it. So you can have these two different overlapping worldviews. Um, five minutes? I gave myself six, but okay. <laughs> And we also built a virtual museum template to show people how they could build things themselves. And this was designed to be as crude and simple as possible. But very briefly, one wall is of uh, a video of a shipwreck from 400 years ago, the Batavia, another 400 year old ship. Another is images, another is a 3D model, another is a map of the site, which is six hours north of the main city. And if you change the the times of one wall, one media wall, it changes the other. So you can see gaps between the different types of media of the collection. And there was a simple way of designing a game so you could create virtual quests to lead people through the museum. We also looked at using linked open data and historical journeys to create interactive maps with audio visual and compared them. And we worked out a way of using 3D models on the database of the Wikipedia. So you could in real time link 3D models text and images and change them like in a 3D Photoshop. And then the, using the semantic web, you could actually ask questions of all the other models in that database across the web. 
So I won't have time to go through this one. And we've also run workshops, well, I've run workshops for the last three or four years, working with archives and museums and students to see if they could create simple prototypes which would then lead to future projects for them. I mentioned it in the workshop this morning, but the one on the right was a 2D game where you help a person with amnesia from 500 years ago go around the city and get their memory back. And the one on the left was a QR AR code game where if you have one hour between trains, it links you around the building and you have a quest to find things. And they're able to do these game prototypes within a few days. Um, but what I've tried to do is work out simple ways and teaching my students as well. What are the simple elements of a game which allows people to understand and learn beyond just the game itself? And on the left hand side is a, basically a first year student group uh, creating a, using unreal augmented reality to learn about pollution and cleaning birds. Um, with a UK university, we also work with students in South and uh, Easter Island and the students who are between eight and 12 years old go to their parents to find out stories in the traditional Polynesian language. And then the students in the UK help them build a, des a game design around these, these lost and half forgotten words. But we've also looked at building escape rooms. And the interesting thing about escape rooms is people create their own memory, they create their own understanding and they work in groups. So I, I think I'm going to run out of time. Do I have two minutes? Yeah. Two minutes. With uh, a group this year, we also built a reverse escape room. And what I thought was really interesting was the students, who are mostly non-digital, developed physical artifacts, which is like a, a quest, which you have to uncover like a detective. And only then and near the end do you put codes into the digital world and you keep a monster out. So it wasn't historical, but it was a museum. And combining physical and digital in this sense was very successful because people could place themselves along what they were comfortable with. And we also ran a, um, just a few weeks ago, a glam event where we asked people who are specialists in interactive, immersive parks and tourist sites to explain how they use escape rooms and immersion and compare the numbers that visit them with the numbers that use the museums and how they use social media. So. I'm going to end now because I've run out of time. We've recently ran a, a PhD project scholarship to find someone who will help us filter AR. It doesn't have to be visual, it could be sound based, so people can limit or constrain their approach to traumatic heritage sites using AR. All right, thank you very much. general question about the possibilities and limitations of using extended reality and game design as a way of doing research. So what, 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 do you have any reflections on, on, on that? This is very much about you know, how you engage with, uh, with the materials, but as a, just as a research process and uh, what kind of questions and issues you can raise. Well, Is this about humanities material? And yeah, I'm asking kind of from a, from a rather traditional humanities background myself. Ask you, know, what, what does this add to my kind of humanities profile? Well, give me a problem and I'll see if I can solve it. Is you an Aristotle to solve virtual ethics? Because I came up this morning. Oh, did it? For <laughs> okay. snakes and platters? Yes. Yeah. So you. I'm trying to remember my lectures on virtual ethics. But <laughs> there is one problem which I think. Aristotle's virtual ethics is about characters and virtue, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is an issue in ethics between principles that we have and the judgments we do every day. Right. So, axiological and what's the other term? The ontological. So, what you could do with XR is it, it works out ethical situations in your philosophy and outside of your philosophy, <coughs> and eventually increases the amount of things that you have to think. Do I have a day-to-day -day principle for this, or do I have to make up something on the spot? And there is a software engineer who actually writes philosophy games like this, not using XR. But what XR mm -hmm. could do is it could find objects and contextualize them in the real world for you. Mm -hmm. So you kind of test people or train people? Yeah. 
That's yeah, right. Is, uh, yeah. There is a philosophy game where you have to put in your beliefs, and by the end of the game, it shows you they're completely logically incoherent with each other. Uh-huh. And I, I haven't found yeah. it lately. It's a bit depressing. Yeah. You don't even know that already, as the ghost of the There's a game called It's Like John Doom. I don't know if I'm going to play it. Um, but um, that question is morality and ethics. Mm-hmm. You play the robot in it. And, and you're given a choice to understand it and obey the orders that you're given by your own, who is about to play his daughter of theirs. And mm-hmm. he's obviously a, you know, he's a bad person. Yeah. And you could play the game and not. Up until that point, anytime you try to disobey, you're not allowed. Mm-hmm. At that point in the game, if you try to disobey, you're allowed. And it, see, I played it and I waited for five minutes until I tried to disobey. And then I realized you're actually allowed to disobey and you're expected to. But from a morality perspective, and you know, mm-hmm. how far do I go? Can I ask a question? Um, there's two. One was, why can't you build that evaluation into a project? Um, I just started a PhD um, like a month ago, and, on, and, and the, the idea is adapting the prose ether, Snorra ether, for a digital age, um, specifically looking at Snorra stuff and, and the, the heritage center up there, and what we take it from what it is, which is a, an interesting little, I don't need you call it, but that was built in 1995, and it looks like it was built in 1995, to something where we can have a layer of Digital interactivity for, for, for the tourists. And somebody asked me, How are you going to write a thesis on it? And I said, I have no idea. But, you know, it's something that has to be done. Yes. I'm just wondering what you mean by that term of what? build evaluation into a project. Well, I will share the evaluation results with the audience. So, what I'm saying in traditional VR studies, you evaluate 10, 12, 100 people. You write it up in a paper, mm-hmm. but they don't necessarily see the results of it or what you learn from it. So, in the evaluation, could you actually develop a method by which people understand the outcomes of it and how it affects the general population? And I'll give you one example. I call it the teach aloud method. So, an HCI, human computer interaction, is something called the speak aloud. You give someone a task and you watch what they do and what they say. Like they swear a lot, for example. But a teach aloud method is if you give them a, a heritage project, see what they understand by how they teach other people. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, what I'm saying there is there is an evaluation you can take away, but they've also learned something by the way you evaluate them. Okay, gotcha. yeah. You've got to design that up front, basically. Well, it's good to design that, <laughs> like everything in a PhD. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I didn't mention is often these, these environments don't have consequences for your decisions. So when we develop virtual heritage, we make the decisions and we show it to people. We don't, we don't allow them to make decisions themselves. Does it make sense? To, yeah. to me, that's the really interesting thing about heritage. Like yeah, the what, feedback loop. That's right. Yeah. But also show mm-hmm. them the consequences of their actions. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe one question. Then we have time afterwards also for, for more general questions. try to do too much with one model. Maybe what we want to do for scholars is different to what we want to do for the public. Does that make sense? But the third answer is we, we make lots of photorealistic examples of current heritage sites, but that's not what they look like. So in my case with the Mayans, all these concrete temples, concrete looking very things you see, they're actually covered in red paint with fingernails from the artists and seashells from the rivers. They're really quite different to our 3D models now. So what's more important? Having every pixel of what it is now, having an idea of how the art is created. Because actually, in the mind side, um, every time you build a building on a building, you give it more life force. It's pretty cooler. So, if you want to destroy a temple city, you go there and you, you actually 
um, tear the fingernails of the artist because then they can't paint, they can't put sculptures up, and it suddenly loses its life force. So which is more important, explaining that or explaining a grey block in the jungle? That's what I mean. Okay, thank you. thank you. I think we need to get on. So now we're going to uh, hear and see uh, a few examples of projects that have been uh, developed here in Iceland. And I want to invite Heila first to the podium from Parity Games. So, welcome. We have a clicker now that's Click. working. If you want to use that, but this is you have a PhD. PDF, I see. I wish I had a PhD. <laughs> Hi, uh, yes, uh, click that too, and does that work like, okay, cool. Uh, my name is Heida, and I'm here because Guðrún was supposed to be here, but she unfortunately couldn't be here, she got sick, and uh, so I'm standing in it. I hope I will do a good job of telling you what she wanted to tell you before. Uh, I'm from Parity. Uh, Parity, uh, Parity are using our cultural heritage to create our virtual fantasy world. Uh, I came into Parity uh, and the first team member coming into Parity after Maria founded the company. And uh, my background is not in uh, cultural heritage, folklore, or anything like that. I'm an artist, I'm a biologist, uh, and I'm an ex-police officer, so I have totally different background than Guru. Uh, but we are founded, yeah. Uh, our uh, goal, Maria founded Parody in 2017 with the uh, specific goal of making, uh, telling stories from women. Uh, and we, she wanted to appeal to a broader audience in a medium that is pretty general, but has did have pretty, in our opinion, narrow focus on, you know, storytelling. Uh, employing diverse teams with diverse backgrounds was also the uh, major goal. Hence, I'm there and going on with totally different backgrounds and a lot of other people. Uh, and our first game being developed now is Island of Winds. And this is our heroine from Island of Winds. Uh, this is Brynhildur in her, her uh, world, a world that mirrors Iceland, but is not exactly Iceland. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the game and about, you know, individual steps in making the game as we want to make it to not tell the exact story of our Icelandic heritage, but mirroring it in a way with our dash of fantasy and, and, and uh, yeah. Uh, yes, as I said before, we want to tell stories about the women and we also wanted to uh, being, uh, sorry, uh, we also wanted to, I was up all night thinking about the lecture, so I'm not going to have the time to left. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Now, uh, we wanted to, uh, uh, we were, when I started with Maria, I'm thinking about what we were going to do for the game. Uh, uh, we wanted to tell stories of the game, new stories that haven't been told, but we also thought that, okay, we can do a lot of words that we, you know, are out there, but it's uh, the best practice when you're telling a story is to tell what you know. And then I said, we, we know Iceland, we know our story, and uh, we raised here and born here. And uh, so we decided we wanted to do a story based on Iceland. Icelandic history and culture. And also, we wanted to do something that hadn't been done a lot before. And uh, that ended up being not having Vikings in our story. Mm -hmm. Because that is a theme that has been used a lot, of course. It's, 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 uh, it's very popular. And uh, then we were led to our idea of 
Island of Twins. And uh, that is a story based in 17th, 18th century world mirrored by Iceland. Icelandic nature and uh, animal life, there is, that is where I come in as a biologist and a huge natural enthusiast. But then we are focusing on using, uh, you know, architecture, uh, crops, uh, folk tales, uh, mythology, and all of the, uh, everything we can, you know, we basically looking for everything we can use because sometimes we feel like our history is a bit poor because we don't have grand buildings and stuff. But then we dive deeper and we have a lot of very unique stories, very unique, uh, like the turf houses, they are pretty unique things in Europe. And uh, so we are uh, emphasizing these, uh, these uh, themes in our game. And me and Guirum, we are very, very strict. And our, uh, when the ID is coming, that we are trying to have them based in this world that we want to, to represent, to be true to our uh, heritage, to our folklore, folk tales, but not exactly you know, uh, copying them. We are adding our 10, 15% of fantasy on top, but it is all very designed and constrained. So sometimes uh, there is a one about the design, maybe you've seen, there are no trees here. Uh, we don't use trees and that is not a cultural thing. Well, actually it is. Uh, uh, there are no trees in Iceland in this time, and that is because people, you know, took them all away to burn them, to build from them, and use them. As happens in small islands where people come, uh, the trees are the first to go. Uh, the sheep have to eat them. The, the people have to 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 heat up their houses and stuff. And uh, so we said, this is also a, a thing that defines our natural landscape. And it was pretty difficult sometimes for, because in many games, there are a lot of trees specially used for level design. Uh, but we can't use trees for level design, for deciding where the player goes. Uh, so we have been very strict on this. And a lot of other things, uh, having you know, things not in the game that weren't represented in this era. Uh, and but you know, then when we break the rules, there is a specific reason. And sometimes just because we want to, without no, no reasons. Uh, as I was saying, yeah, this is from the Cortez. Uh, we chose the 17th, 18th century mainly because uh, Maria was very interested in the magic and the, the Galtra Brenner, the, the magic fever in Iceland in this time. And mostly because they were mainly women that were hurt by that. And then we are celebrating art and crafts and magic. We, are, we have real life objects in our game. I'm going to tell you about that later. Uh, and uh, we have mythical creatures and folk tales being retold as folk tales are. Uh, retold in our real world. We re retell them again and again. And here is the hero of the pop. This is the actual Alba potter or elf pot. And this image is actually, this is not a real thing in the image, it's a virtual uh, pot in a virtual world. Um, this is, uh, yeah, uh, Parati is cooperating with the National History Museum and uh, the Natural History Museum is scanning uh, uh, its objects, and uh, we are allowed to use some of them, including this pot. And this pot is already in our game, and it has a specific story. I will tell you later. And to do, be able to do this means a lot to, to, to our team and our story, having real life objects in with their own history in a game that we can even, you know, retell or you know adjust the telling of is a huge thing for us. 
and uh, this Alva Potter is just to tell you a little bit about its journey. It's from maybe 17th, 16th century. Uh, I, I'm not the expert in this. I'm retelling what Bruno said. said. So. But uh, it's, uh, in my opinion, it looks, it's, it's very appropriate now because we have Halloween and it looks like a witch's hat. It has ears and everything. So uh, it was found in Dyrafjörður in the uh, uh, 19th century, I think, uh, by a man called Pauli Guðnason. And uh, that man uh, told the story that he was walking on the beach one evening and then he saw a group of people walking on the beach. And there was a child uh, following the group of people on the beach. And he said, then the child uh, put something on the ground and ran after the people. And when he came to the beach, there was a, this pot lying on the shore. And then the people disappeared. And the reasoning was that these were elves and the elf baby that uh, lost its pot there. So he took the pot, kept it, and then another uh, inhabitant of the West Fjords took the pot, got the pot. And then the pot was donated to the National History Museum in Iceland. And uh, it was three discount, and now it is in our game, in our virtual world. So it's come all the way from the elves to our island of this. So it's very appropriate because we also have elves. Uh, so the idea of having something like mythology, mythological in real life and in a virtual world and also in a mythical world, it's kind of like this pot is representing. So it's actually from Elves, if you believe it, and has been in a, in a very academic machine and then in our very fantastic world. So it's a very interesting perspective in my opinion. Do you see it? Is it very black? Or? This is a. Yeah, okay. Yes, thank you. This is a screenshot from in, within our game. And uh, as you see, oh, the pot is there by the fire. And uh, this is one of our houses. Very nice this, this uh, visiting there. And uh, we have many other, like in the back, look at the back there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the back of the, the pot, we have the, a chest that is also uh, a scan. And, uh, and this is a very, very tired fisherman having the pot. I don't know what he does with the pot, but having it there, I'm kind of thinking maybe not eating from it. I don't know. Uh, what we are going to do in our game. Uh, the plan is to create our own in-game museum with uh, uh, all the items that we are scanning in the game and also the creatures we are making in the game or uh, representations of the fantastical, uh, the, the fictional mythological beings. And uh, this is going to be an outdoor machine, museum with walls made of rock, kind of like uh, the turf houses. Uh, and uh, when the player encounters or sees an item in the game, uh, the item appears in the machine. And the uh, uh, experience is supposed to be just the same as going into a museum. Uh, you have tags, you have information, you have uh, uh, things to tell you and tell you more information about the, the specific object and even information outside the game because sometimes we have creatures that not, we don't tell the story of a scoff being, uh, one of our mythological uh, beings, exactly in the game. But in this museum, uh, as I understand it, it's supposed to be um, the exact information from our folklore. And uh, so you can get a deeper understanding of, of all the creatures and assets. And this is the top view. This is created by Guru. She is the, the primary owner of this idea, Guru Bora. And this is her idea of how it's going to look. This is the top perspective. And uh, I think it looks amazing. Uh, it's all circular. And uh, I, you know, I, I, don't, I 
Y eso es como que el main thing I want to look at in the kingdom. But I look at a lot of stuff in the kingdom already, but not this. It's not uh, made yet, so. But uh, yes, the plan is to have all the creatures uh, in the houses uh, uh, and pots we put in the ground in this museum. Um, and this is a mock up a screenshot from a design document how it could look. Uh, I'm just finishing. And uh, yes, so when you encounter this in uh, the Russian museum, you interact with it and then you get the text up and stuff. So this is a very interesting idea. And here's a bit of a Bjarkirkungur. This is a sample of the uh, possible tag you can get in the museum. Yeah, and then I was going to talk a bit about this, but I'm going to do a very quick one. This is to, just to celebrate our cultural heritage of the Icelandic crafts in our game. And uh, as you see, Breinadur is basically wearing a design of the, based on the Icelandic Kaldbúningur. And I had a lot of I am responsible for this massacre of the Icelandic National Costume <laughs> and uh, I will take all the blame. But uh, actually first we wanted to have, and we have told the story a lot, we like telling it. And but we want to use the culture we have, but sometimes it's not possible. Because now in 2023 we still have problems having long skirts in games. <laughs> I don't know why, but we can do mostly everything else talk about all the VR stuff and, and, and AI, but scratch and games, no, that's too difficult. So I had to redesign costume and make it like, well, that was what that was of. Um, and then talking about uh, user experience and user interface, uh, something we did, a uh, did in our game, she designed all the UI and the user interface, it's all based on stitch work from Icelandic Valdringar, Gjöldsösömur. What you see on the costumes, like on the body, it's all women's hand, women's craftsmanship. And we are paying no tribute like this. Uh, we do in our user interface. And mock-ups, uh, hat screens and now, if you see it, you see the signs around the. Uh, this is a starting. It's all based on the what you see on the national costume, and uh, I think it's one of the best UIs I have seen in a game. I play a lot of games, and uh, I think Gurn has made a pretty new way of uh, interpreting because UI is usually the square and boring in my opinion. But it just need took leave to do. And make different from the pitch, but it's still this Havgur. Uh, Havgur is actually something that is probably bigger than the center of town. This in the ocean, and then, yeah, just to see. So, uh, and here is Gurum. <laughs> the one was supposed to be here, too. and uh, this is our team now. So, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for jumping in. Now. That's a certain yes. So, one or two questions to Halo before we go on. Um, yes, Ed? Will people be able to buy the actual costumes after they've played the game? Well, I am certainly hoping. I'm, I am a big cosplay fan and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, conference nerd. And I am hoping we can make costumes. We actually, uh, one of our uh, people who worked in the game is a costume maker now and we'll be working full time in that. And uh, yeah, uh, hopefully we can. I have been thinking about myself going to uh, the uh, National Handcraft Association and, and learn to make actual national costume and maybe iterate on it. <laughs> so, so yeah. 
that would be possible. Can I quickly suggest two things on that? So Tencent, the China company, their, their game was a role-playing 15th century fantasy, but they managed, they found people wanted to buy the costumes, so they make them with fashion and then historians and so forth and they yeah. it. And the second thing is the wonderful decorations you showed, it reminds me of the lily pad Arduino, which was an uh, MIT scientist who developed um, home electronics, particularly for women, using embroidery patterns, so yeah. you can make smart clothing. Yeah. Yeah. I can find a photo for you. Yeah, that would be question. fantastic to, to see that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Carry on. Uh, Thank you guys for inviting me here, and uh, thank you for the Alan the Wind's uh, presentation. It's changed quite a bit since I pre-tested it at uh, Technus Colin with my, my seven-year-old, I guess, at the time. Uh, we're looking forward to testing it some more. I work with Maria at CGP Games and uh, Jon Hattler and Matti and all these people, so it's, it's the old Icelandic game community. Uh, but so, yeah, so I'm Thrusted from uh, Apple Engineering. Uh, we are probably the least expected uh, candidate to be here today, a civil engineering company, but uh, we do we do everything from uh, we scan things from Cornish hen thighs to uh, volcanoes, uh, hydroelectric dams, everything. Digital twins are uh, a growing product of ours. We started as me in 2017. Now we're eight in our team, and that's in six years. So uh, a little bit about me, uh, as you can. This is, this is me at my happiest, and this is me as a digital twin of me in a, a E1 line in 2011. We had a, a digital twin avatar creator then. Uh, it didn't take off as well as we hoped to, but we, we got it a little bit off the ground. Uh, yeah, so, so that's just a lot about my education. Um, I, I went to Florida to, to study animation. Went to Copenhagen to study meteorology. Does anybody here know what meteorology is? It's a, well, it's, it's, a, it's basically a marriage of art and engineering. So uh, a lot of uh, computer vision, all this kind of stuff. Uh, then I joined uh, EFLA in uh, 2017 and uh, got an Epic Mega Grant in 2020. And uh, uh, I promote digital twins in any shape and form uh, as a part of my work. Uh, both at Apple and with other you know, uh, companies. And uh, my interest in uh, photogrammetry and digital twins started around 2006 when I found out about this uh, technology being developed inside institutes like uh, Caltech, MIT, all this stuff. It required computers the size of Havgula, the downtown area, mm -hmm. and now uh, we have them in here in this little device, and there's like eight apps on this thing that do exactly the same thing, and they all do it to a varying degree of quality. Uh, so, but going to the Digital stat Statues Project, or Stavranger Statues, uh, it is basically a collaborative uh, project between Atla and the Anna Jonsson uh, Sculpture Museum. Uh, so how many of you have been in the Anna Jonsson Museum this year? This year. This year? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in your life? And you, then you all, uh, I, I assume that most of you identify with, uh, with the feeling that you get, get when you go in there. It's a, it's a very uh, different type of museum. It, it, it's filled with stories. It's very visual. It's very hard to reach if you can't walk. All that kind of thing. And especially like if, you're, if you're from out of town, it's the, it's the one thing that you forget to visit but wish you had when you come to Reykjavik. Because it's right next to Hathjörsjöpja. Why wouldn't you go there? But, uh, but it was, it was when I was talking to Almatis, this is just a little bit of backstory, when the museum was actually run by the, by Anna Jonsson and his wife, there was a, there was a sign saying no children allowed. So it was a, it was a very forbidding, very unwelcoming place. But, uh, so this, this, uh, this project, it started as an accident, basically. Well, it started as a, as a a scan project that I did without asking permission, and then I went in there. And, <laughs> but yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going off course a little bit. But uh, so it started with uh, me visiting the garden where the statues and, and sculptures were all accessible. And I had just gotten this, uh, this idea 
from attending a, a conference in 2019 that, you know, starting to scan everything in my, to my family's displeasure. You know. <laughs> Gosh, stop it, scan this, no, wait for me. Uh, but uh, so, so I was visiting Ener Jones Museum in the, in the Hüstfeld, in the autumn break at my children's school. So I went up to the, uh, the person working the front desk and said, hey, you know, I've, I've tried, I've been doing this kind of stuff with the museums on, in the sculptures in the back. Um, would you guys like to see them? And she was, she, she, she looked like she had seen a ghost or something. She's like, oh my God, I gotta call Alma. And so she called Alma these, and you know, things moved forward and we decided to apply for grants, uh, a grant by the, the uh, Ministry of Education at the time. They've changed names and morphed into something else since then. But uh, so we, we got a grant that allowed us to scan a large number of the sculptures and put them in a 3D viewer. Uh, we, we went with Sketchfab as a platform for this. And so, so the idea of the project was to, to make all the sculptures that we could, we, we did set a modest amount for the first part, it was like 10, sort of like that, uh, so that people from everywhere could see them and not just people that were in the museum and also we wanted to have uh, accessibility. And, you know, fortunately for us, uh, people weren't able, allowed to go into the museums because of COVID, so we had more people coming in through the digital port. Um, but so, so our, our pur uh, purpose was also that we wanted to prove this technology could work on, uh, on a larger scale. And uh, uh, so, so we got a, a follow-up grant to scan the entire museum. Everything inside inside the museum, the museum itself, uh, all the environment, uh, and and also it was convenient that this year is the 100th anniversary of the museum. It's the first, uh, it's the oldest continuously running publicly available museum in Iceland. So it's it's a uh, there's there's many things to celebrate. Uh, we also um, one of the things that we are still working on a little bit is the study materials. To, to present to kids uh, in the, what is called K-10, I guess, everywhere else it's K-12. Uh, so, so it's, a, it's a, a way to get them to study art and, and, and think about the, the stories being told in the sculptures. And uh, uh, have you, has, any, has anyone here seen uh, the Sketchfab models? One, two, okay, then four. Okay, then we will, we will have a, a Bit of a look. You don't mind. Let's see. Yeah. So, so uh, I forgot to mention uh, one. Uh, we, we also got a, a sort of a follow-up grant from Listir Atla, which is a, a separate entity, which allowed us to do a little bit more of the promotional stuff. So, so it was Pata Manika Jodis and Listir Atla. But uh, I hope you don't mind uh, going. So what we did for this, which is a, a, a pro tip for everybody here that's working in a nonprofit, if you want to use, I'm, I, just to make sure I don't get paid for saying this, I'm not promoting Sketchfab as a platform or anything like that, but they do have a non -pro oh, you don't see the, oh, how do I, I have a, a, I have the viewer on this monitor, how do I switch it to the big one? So just, Oh, there you go. All right. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. And then I won't see it anyway. But, but yeah. So, so what you can do if you are running a nonprofit, you can apply for a nonprofit. Uh, I think it's an ultra or an enterprise version of Sketchfab, which allows you to run AR in this. Uh, I have a, just a personal pro version, and and it will not let me run AR on my phone. So if you, if, you, if you need AR, then you can apply for a non-profit. So this is then, uh, it's a very iconic statue in the center of the, in the sculpture garden. And this is all from an iPhone. So this is all, uh, uh, this is not like, uh, because you know, those of you that have been here long enough in Iceland know that the weather will change in 15 minutes, so you can't set up elaborate uh, six-hour shoots on sculptures and stuff like that. 
Uh, my favorite method is using a drone for this because uh, it, it allows to, you know, you don't have to bring ladders and stuff like that. But as you can see, it's very, fairly detailed. But because it's running on Sketchfab, it can't really run. Like we have a, a 200 million polygon version of this, which we were, we were thinking about running a 2 billion polygon version in the winter. But you know, it's not really, not really the best way to present to, to school children. But it also, the beautiful thing about running this on a, uh, let me just go back to the presentation. Oh, there we go again. Yeah, so, so, uh, so the, the, the cool thing about having this on, on uh, Sketchfab is that we are not uh, limited by municipality IT restrictions. That's one of the things that we ran into very early was that, you know, we were presenting this at a teacher conference and, and the first thing they said was, Reykjavik IT will not allow us to install uh, Sketchfab as an app on a phone or uh, on children's tablets. Uh, and another thing that we ran into was that um, we had, uh, what is, is Sue the Thirsty here? Yep, there he is. So he had already done a lot of uh, uh, readings about the, the Henry Jonsson sculptures as a part of a different project. So we had this elaborate plan to have Sjöldi uh, Thirsty's voice talking about the, the Henry Jonsson sculptures. We had it running under the every you know applicable sculpture. And then Sketchfab decided, oh, we can't have audio anymore because somebody's using uh, copyrighted materials on separate projects. And so they just, you know, blank state, you know, like they just threw everybody's audio off. So we were, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we are still kind of missing is that we have, uh, uh, we want to have it in Icelandic, English, German, uh, Polish, you know, uh, Filipino, Vietnamese, whatever. But, you know, they can't have everything, I guess. Uh, but so in, in the real world, we do have, uh, so, so the, the, uh, the digital statues has very, you know, uh, real applications because we are also assisting uh, the listers of Reykjavik with uh, inspecting the statues, uh, for example, with the uh, Yung Siu Son, we, we, we discovered uh, a, a noose around Yung Siu Son's neck in Östervöldur. Uh, it was two years ago, somebody had put a, a string around his neck uh, that was removed. Uh, it was kind of ironic. I was, uh, Janet, is that her name? Yeah. yeah, so I was with Janet, the, uh, the person that's taking care of most of the statues. We were flying around the Seals, and at, at the exact same time, a homeless man decided to fire off a, a bomb, like a Kind of like it was, it was almost like a phosphorus bomb because it was just churning away at the base of uh, of your know, So we were just standing there while I was flying, and somebody was like we were documenting uh, <laughs> vandalism. So it was, uh, uh, but we then then I just took out my phone and, and documented the vandalism, and I, I, then she had that fully, you know, in in her hands. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah. So so. So this is the, the, the sort of the real world uh, applications that we have is that we can preserve them in many stages. Like the, uh, for example, the statues in front of uh, the sculptures in front of Stjörnar, the, the the prime minister. We were we weren't able to uh, document the, the conditions of those sculptures before she had you know put up all the all the scaffolding and, and fixed them. But then I went in after she had fixed them and we documented their condition after the restorations. So we were hoping uh, to, to do more of that, but uh, uh, as you all know, I guess more than anybody, is that uh, money is very tight in this field, and it was decided that, yeah, well, photographs will uh, suffice. So that's a, that's a, that's a constant uh, battle, I guess. Even for when you're in a civil engineering company, we, we do have budgets to consider. Um, so uh, the, the, stat, the status of digital twins in other fields is that, uh, for example, I was at a conference uh, two weeks ago, 30 degrees Celsius in New Orleans, very nice. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and and it, digital twins were everywhere. Everybody's doing digital twins. You know, uh, 
we, we had a lot of interest from companies that have come to Iceland like, oh, you know, we have, we have so much data that we can't you know, process. How do we do it? And then I said, oh, we can process data. And uh, uh, so everybody is really interested in, in using it and, and kit bashing. If, are you familiar with the word kit bashing? So it's basically taking you know, items and, and throwing them together like you do in computer games. You take familiar settings and make new ones. And, and so, so that's what a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of like you see here down at the bottom, uh, Star Wars has been doing it quite a bit with Icelandic uh, locations. Uh, we are about to do a project uh, that will kind of make Apple a uh, Apple Galactic Engineering because we've been we've been uh, we've been twice approached by NASA and the European Space Agency to do digital analogs of the Moon and Mars in Iceland, and I, I was there. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much actually done with this. Uh, let's see, what's how are we doing? This? Yeah, so 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 basically, I know. A lot of this may not be interesting to uh, heritage preservation, but uh, but we are doing a lot of uh, uh, using digital twins for uh, monitoring of, of uh, construction infrastructure, all this stuff. Uh, also, just digital twin systems, which is not like a physical thing, but more uh, uh, like a monitoring system of you know fire hazards, uh, water, power, pressure, all this kind of stuff. We also monitor volcanoes. Uh, we we have uh, we are, we go into the highlands to monitor uh, uh, rivers, uh, hydroelectric dams. We monitor the nobody wants to hear it, but the, the crawling of the water dams in the highlands. They, they they are like the glaciers. They move a little bit every year. Uh, we are using thermal cameras to monitor that because the, the the water leaking from underneath the dams is colder than of course the area around it. If if you could believe that. Uh, but what I'm most excited about right now is uh, using the little devices that we all have. Uh, most of, like if you have an iPhone 12 Pro or later, then you have a what's called a LiDAR on your phone. And with a simple app, you can capture, like if you see here, this is a, a piece of rock at Gudfoss. It looks like this in real life. This is actually also a 3D model of it. But this is what it looks like in ZBrush. And I was in, the, uh, in Full Sail, my old school. I was doing a presentation similar to this one. And I showed them this rock and another one in the next slide. And I asked them, how, how long would it take you to model this? And they just said, oh, it's a full day. And I was like, it took me three minutes. And they, they just, everybody, the ones that didn't have an iPhone, they were fucking free. I also don't get money from an Apple to say this, but, uh, but it, has, uh, uh, it has sped up a lot of uh, uh, workflows, especially if you're working with, with areas that are not familiar to most people. Um, I was going to run a few uh, models of, of larger areas if we have, do we have a couple of minutes? Okay, okay so I think we will see, for example, Okay, so this is the uh, this is another viewer that we use uh, quite a bit. It's called Mira. It runs uh, two billion polygons, uh, hundreds of gigapixels, and it's all in real time. So, for example, here we are we are working on a, a digital twin, and this is insane. This is seventy three million polygons, nine point nine four gigapixels. This is for an infrastructure project that we are working on. I can't show you the rest of it because you will go insane when you see it. <laughs> no, but, uh, but we have uh, uh, we have authorization from Isadia to fly uh, near airports and stuff like that. But this is Hasbjörn's app, and 
as you can see, we can go pretty pretty close. Um, let's see. Here we go. Let's. It was. It was a quarter past one. <laughs> This is also a very natural state of Hafnitschikir because we, I, I don't think any of us here in, in here have ever seen Hafnitschikir without any kind of scaffolding. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think my great-grandfather worked on it and there was scaffolding then. And then I think my grandfather worked on it and there was scaffolding then. And then my father worked on it and there was scaffolding then. And, uh, this is my work on it and there was scaffolding. <laughs> and we, we can also see, uh, we also use this for um, uh, concrete damage inspection, we use it for tan inspection, things, things like that. But you can see it's pretty detailed. Uh, we've been to... Have lunch? What? This was an interesting day to be flying a drone because the volcano was going on and the helicopters were there every three minutes and people were complaining about the drone. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it was an interesting... But yeah, so, so the point of this project was to look at uh, Visual impact studies, uh, because when when uh, when we do visual impact studies, we usually take a photograph and try to fit our 3D model into it, and then we try to tell people, oh, you won't see it, but uh, but it always happens that these impact studies are 50 kilometers away, 20 kilometers, something like that, and you can't really realistically expect somebody to fit a 3D model with a good you know distortion or something like that. But so we we decided to let people. And this is a, a, it's going to be presented soon, I think, hopefully. And we are going to allow people to be on a digital twin at you know, human level. And they can look in the direction that the project is. And they, they can just make it up for themselves because the, the windmills will be you know, moving. It will all be in uh, uh, running an Unreal Engine. So it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see, maybe go and see something else here. Did, uh, uh, it's finally a place that I think none of us here have been to. We can also go. It is a heritage site that has been spoiled by one person that had tomatoes. Have you heard about the tomatoes in Switzerland? <laughs> Somebody didn't uh, uh, bother taking all the trash, and somewhere in Switzerland there is a tomato plant. <laughs> it was not carried by birds. So this is uh, Switzerland. And it looks, uh, this is not data from us, this is from the Notre Dame Department, but they gave us the data and we put it all into a, a, a GPS rotation. And it, we also have a, a, we have a digital twin of all of Iceland, but it's in varying uh, resolution. It's from 10 meter height lines down to one and a half centimeter. Uh, yeah, so if you, just a little sales pitch, if you need really good looking data, come to us. <laughs> We have, we have all the data. But yeah, so, so this is uh, a little side note on the digital statues, but the, um, I can talk about this afterwards if you want. It. But if you have questions now, I can also answer them. Uh, any questions? Well, thank you, Buster. Mm -hmm. And even you said that the, the center statue that we use the drone for it. Are you using lidar on a drone? No. Okay. The the, uh, the lidar. Well, I mean, we could use uh, ground-based lidar because we have you know varying uh, detail lidar on the ground. But we find it that uh, the, the the current version of the lidar camera that we do have, we have a L1 on a uh, on a Matrice 300. We find it is. We, we are early adopters of the technology, so it's a, the L1 was the one that we got, the L2 is out, and it, that's the usable version. The L1 is kind of like, you know, training. We've, we've, we've used it with varying degrees of success. I was just wondering if you're doing that on drones with LiDAR, I just don't know. No, 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 no. Which one it is. <laughs> no we, we, the only LiDAR that we use on, on oh, statues are, yeah. is the one, the, the time of flight laser, which is, you know, Apple talk for LiDAR, but it's, uh, it's not... Like if you if you say lidar in and and iPhone in a lidar uh, forum, yeah. people will go insane because they hate the lidar on the phone. 
So these are using just you know high resolution cameras on. on yeah, yeah. The, uh, all, all the all the major things that we use, we have uh, uh, forty five megapixel cameras. We are looking at uh, medium format cameras as well for the drone. But uh, yeah, we have we have a fleet of drones going ranging from you know ones that could, that you can put in your pocket to uh, like fixed wing drones that fly for like two hours at a time. So the models that you uh, scan, mm -hmm. if you were to decide to render out a sequence of a raw material, whatever it is, which uh, render engine would you prefer to run it on? Well, uh, we did, uh, and I can, if I have, do I have maybe a minute? Yes. Okay, I can show you, uh, because we, we got permission to use it for a, a separate a separate project, which was the uh, the Epic Mega Grants project. And let's see, that, that uh, to, uh, there we go. Yeah, let's see. I just need to run my game. Uh, my, my preferred engine is uh, Unreal and also Twin Motion. Twin Motion is a, a, a shell that runs on, on Unreal. And it's a, it's a, um, it is a, what this is, a, okay. Yeah, it, it's basically a, it was thought of as a, a as a visualization, uh, architectural visualization uh, software, but it's running. We are running it as a uh, as basically an all uh, engine. Let's see. Sorry, it's just a, yeah. Here we go. So, so the story behind this project was that uh, just before COVID hit, uh, I, I applied for a mega grant from Epic that says you make it in Unreal, it, and we don't care what you make the take the money, you know, take this money, make something in Unreal, and show it to us whenever you finish. So I started. Can you can you turn the lights down a little bit? So the original idea was to destroy two farms in Iceland. Uh, but then, you know, as the, I was halfway through that project using dynamics and everything in Unreal to destroy these uh, historical farms. Uh, and then after, when COVID was uh, on its way, I was just tired of destroying things. So I decided, you know, what if I, you know, what if I show something, you know, peaceful and beautiful? And then I contacted my contact at Epic and said, you know, can I change my, can I take my old project? I'm halfway through and just throw it out the window and do something like this. And he was like, absolutely. And you know, as long as you still have money to do the project, that's fine. So I did that. And I got permission from uh, the museum to use the, 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 the scans that we already did. And we are showing basically the passing of time in you know, uh, the same camera shots. And, uh, and they were very happy with uh, with the results. It's being used for to promote the software, uh, and also just to promote, to promote us. And hopefully, the Inner Jonsson Sculpture Museum in the in the same sort of the uh, Etnia And there you can see this passing of time a little bit more by seeing the trees grow and the people also. But they, you know, they don't really grow. They just sort of appear appear bigger. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so, so this is all running on Unreal, but I didn't have to code a single thing. Uh, there's, there's a lot of limitations to Twin Motion, but uh, they are improving it with a reiteration. Uh, it's very easy. I, co I, compare, I compare Twin Motion to, like if you take Unreal Engine and Twin Motion, it's like comparing uh, technical Lego and Playmobil. So it's, 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 uh, it's very fast results with very limited options. But uh, for, for most of my work, this is sufficient. Uh, then we don't need to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, anyway. So, yeah, we can go into this uh, after. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you for so, Thank you. Thank you. And now we have the...
us the presentation of the day. Find your slides here. and I'm a digital artist at Kakari and my background is in uh, film and so uh, animation and visual effects in film and TV shows but uh, I've been working at Kakari for the past a bit over three years now so Kakari has 30 years of experience in creating award winning interactive experiences and we mostly design for exhibitions, museums, and brands. And we are very passionate about weaving education, information, and data into compelling stories that leave a lasting impression on visitors. So we are here to talk about how we can use technology to preserve cultural heritage and Many of them are outdoors, so how might we design an experience which allows people to be outdoors and have a seamless extended reality experience? Uh, I'm going to share insight into two of the recent projects, XR, XR projects that we've done, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we made some decisions and a little bit more behind the scenes. So I will start with Tinkadir, uh, the well-known Tinkadir. I think everyone, most people know that place. And that was launched in June last year. So we already made, five years ago, we made an indoor exhibition. Uh, it, it's quite a large exhibition in Tinkadir co called Heart of Iceland. And here you can see some images from the installations. And uh, we were then asked to come up with a solution how to make uh, a solution that would work outside, that would highlight some of the archeo uh, archaeological findings in the area. So a little bit about Tinkwete, what we took in mind when we designed this. So everyone, this is how most people know Tinkwete, the beautiful nature and the heart of the nation, first parliament. But it's also a remote area with heavy winters and conditions can be quite harsh in the place. And when I say harsh, they can get quite, yeah, very harsh. <laughs> so, this is a little bit about the concept, so um, what happened in the park and it's an outdoors in a rural environment with no uh, access to electricity and we want to show how the events happen in that place. So what could it have looked like when they gathered here every year? So the concept is to see into the past of Althingi, in Tinkadir. So our solution uh, is what we call the Outdoor Explorer. And this is on a, is a yeah, mobile XR, XR version. And the concept of this is that it's a simple QR code that you scan and which is easy to use. Most people know QR codes. Uh, it works on smartphones. Uh, there's no app needed, like uh, Eric talked about. We don't need to do the extra step of downloading something, waiting for it to download, and people people don't have the patience for that sometimes. So it's a it just opens up and uh, open up, opens up in the browser. So it's quite fast to load. And this works in heavy weather and all year round. 
So this is how it works. There was a new pathway built in Kinkarrir around the, in this area. And uh, so we placed signs along the pathways with information and, and illustrations. And there's also a QR code in the corner where, where you can scan and look into the past. And I have a little video for you. into the creation of, of this. So on the right you can see a map, a top down map of the area and the yellow line is where the new pathway is and all the uh, archaeological findings, the houses and booths. And we decided to map out where we want to have the scenes happen. So you can see the numbers there. Uh, so then we made uh, panorama pictures and started to draw the, the stories so we can kind of came up with stories what's happening there or who is who is what are those people what are they doing just, and um, and then we were also uh, present with uh, some archaeologists and uh, the client of course to decide how we're gonna do the layouts how many houses are how how big of a uh, not the town, but the, of the area, how many houses were, how many people, and such stuff. So it's also uh, some notes from the clients that we were going to choose. Uh, then we took some 3D, uh, 360 photos from the location of each scene. And it's a 360 because we wanted the user to be able to look all around. And we did uh, green screen filming with actors and contacted the lighting community and got all the right flowing and so it was it felt real and um, then for the post processing of the Vikings we, we, uh, we kind of call them ghosts because they yeah the, it was a decision to make them stylized like these ghosts because that's how the one of the installation in the indoor exhibition is so we wanted to have it the same in the same style. Uh, then it was time to do uh, the 3D assets. Uh, there were not so many visual references for uh, how these so-called boots look like, but uh, we got information from the archaeologists that they were most likely, but it was a mixture of, uh, so we made quite a few uh, Quite a few iterations of like how they should be, and on the right side you can see I usually make like a, like a proxy, just like a simple cube, and then where we place them before I put the actual models in. So this is kind of the process, uh, and here you can see like uh, step by step. So this is the before picture. This is how it looks like today. Then we needed to do some environment cleanup to remove all the paths and buildings, add a little bit more trees and grass. Then we added the, the houses and the other assets. And then the, the ghosts or the Vikings on top. And uh, here is a side by side before and after. And in the end of the presentation, I, I will give you a QR code to test so you can test the scenes out yourself. And one last thing about, <laughs> about this project, uh, it's just a small fun fact. So on the signs on the pathway you have these illustrations and this is uh, this is the scene where Queen uh, Lothlielata and Patrick and Lankrop were, were uh, the, lo the lovers. And so and that is actually me and <laughs> my co <laughs> as a 
reference models for the. Yeah. This is actually the software de developer that did that, and I'm the creator. So I thought it was quite funny that we are the we are them in this. <laughs> okay, so next. So Hopstad is another uh, culture that is. Um, at least I. Um, Maybe the crowd knows better, but I didn't know about this place before this project. And this is an XR project that we launched just recently in August this year. So this is how the site looks like. Um, or this photo is taken before we uh, did the installation. So it's a it's a room. It's the uh, remains of a Viking old Viking longhouse that was discovered somewhere in the 1980s where they were, they were actually building a kindergarten and they were picking up the, the ground and found the ruins so they had to uh, change the design of it. So they preserved the area and built a small park around it. And um, yeah, so this is how it looks like. Uh, so the concept is, it's an early Viking longhouse and in um, urban environments, and I don't know if you can see it. It's like this is a garabaj. If you can see it, it's here. <laughs> see that? So it's kind of a crap between a parking lot and a kindergarten, and this is garatok next to it. But uh, yeah, and but here because it's in the city, we have access to electricity, so we've got more options of what we wanted to do with it. And we want to show what the what life would be like. In that place, in that time. Uh, so, who lived there? What could have been their day to day activities? And uh, the concept is to travel back in time to this place in Hofstadter. So, this is another outdoor explorer, but in this uh, case, we went with uh, a binocular, an XR binocular. Uh, we really wanted to have like a, a physical installation at this place because the, it's not as harsh weather as in, in Finland, so um, and a little bit different. So we also think that um, the binoculars, when you see a binocular, you want to go to it, you want to look through it. So they're very uh, easy to use, accessible and very inviting. And because we have electricity, we have computer power, so we could have a higher quality content there. And so this is how it works. There are just three, play, three binoculars placed uh, in the park. You go up to them, there's a button that, you, that triggers the experience. And I have a video of that too. So here are some of the first storyboards. Like I said, we have three binoculars, so uh, three different views. Two of them are widescreen, which you can you can pan around, and you trigger uh, different animations. And the one on the right is a static static one, where you see the longhouse building up. So these are like some of the early sketches that we did on the views, and we wanted to have this here and there, and create it some stories around it. Uh, my first assignment was, well, one of my first assignments was to start to map out the area because I was supposed to build up the house and put the assets and I wanted to have the scale correct and then all the measurements to make it easier. So 
I'm also a drone enthusiast, like Paul. <laughs> and I was happy to be able to use my drone. And it's actually my first time doing a photogrammetry with a drone, so I was quite excited. So I flew up my drone and took many uh, photos all around the site. Uh, which I gathered in a software that makes a point cloud and uh, from that I got the textures and everything that created that model that you can see on the bottom of the left and I just find these texture maps really funny it looks like probably very abstract, abstract to you but this photo in the middle is all the small textures the, the material and the colors of the model Uh, there were, in co comparison to Hubble, there were a bit more uh, reference images that I could use for this project. I used the uh, Spider Nella, which is of course a replica of a uh, place there, and I had some drawings and more and the more material to work with. So the 3D assets, here's some photos from the photogrammetry as a base to build up on. Uh, so yeah, you can see the, the roof, like the roof sticks and the, a bit of the build up there. Like this colorful, colorful uh, image is actually um, when I'm painting the, because I recreated the whole environment. So I'm painting the ground, the grass, the uh, rocks, the straws, flowers. So it's, yeah, that's that. And, um, and then we had to also alter the environment because obviously when you are in the place, you just see the houses, you're in the middle of the city. But in these times, you, like you see on the bottom of the um, author, you could actually see to the ocean, you could see the, the land. So that was a bit of a, uh, we had to recreate that and kind of think out how that really looked like before, before, uh, before all these uh, houses and the city was built. And also went to uh, Hilma to take reference photos of, you see it, uh, of trees and bushes because apparently at this time, this, this is what the 10th, 11th century, there were much more trees in the area. Uh, again, uh, green screen filming with Viking people. We even brought a horse on set, which was <laughs> a fun experience. And uh, this picture of the woman weaving is actually quite interesting because um, these rocks, they're called uh, looms, I think looms. They are actually, these are actually the rocks that were found at the site of Hofstadter. And we actually Oh, and oh. <laughs> then step by step, how it is with the environment, the people, and a side by side picture of how it looks today and how it looks like in the binoculars. Uh, I wanted to mention this one because technology is always evolving and uh, AI has been, artificial intelligence has been very skyrocketing in the last one, two years. Uh, so for this, I actually use AI for this uh, part. So you can see the top, the, the first we made the, the static binocular, it was a white screen that you can see. But then, uh, later, before the opening, we had to change it to a square because we changed the view. So I thought it was going to be like a week of work or something to, or maybe not a week, but some days of work to, to fix it, to, oh, I need to fix the ground and everything. But thanks to AI, I was able to do it in less than 10 minutes. <laughs> so that was an easy fix, and I think. Uh, using stuff like this is going to be more and more happening. Uh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was the last slide from that. I just wanted to mention that uh, these are just two projects that, that we have uh, done recently. We have a lot of other pro projects, other uh, 
like use of other, like we have VR, AR, uh, and XR, and all kinds of other um, technology to uh, tell our stories. So, yeah, thank you for joining. And here you can scan if you want to try out the internet app. I think we also have it somewhere on paper if you want to check it. Thank you. So, any questions specific to Sudna before we can open up to uh, discussion with everyone? Well, we are setting up the mic. Well, thank you very much. Just one thing because I have uh, been to recently do do work on this exhibition. Um, one of the things that might, might be disturbing when you're uh, with a group in Hotspur mm -hmm. is that there are only three binoculars, mm -hmm. so you might have to wait. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there any, any other? Is there any specific reason that you wanted to have um, binoculars? I think maybe like I think the binoculars. I mean, the, when you look, you don't, it doesn't take a lot of time mm -hmm. to with large group. It could be, uh, I think, I think it was actually, I think it was maybe more about having better quality because of the binoculars and just all the reasons that I mentioned that it's like inviting is a fun experience to look into binoculars and, and see the environment change, but yeah. Absolutely, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, it's like but yeah, I get the it. video, you know, when, when the family is out here walk, and it's nice thinking that I was yeah. wondering, like, because I want to. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, I mean, I think that it is designed for, of course, much bigger crowds mm -hmm. because there's so many people. Uh, Hofstad is not as busy, mm -hmm. but but yeah, I get your point with if there are some groups. No, I, 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 I don't know if I can give you yeah, <laughs> that, that answer, but <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say I followed your company since 2013, and I say you exhibited at Vision Heritage, and I loved it. It's something very tactile, and you can move them around, and children are drawn to it. And this is going back to your question, Erica, about the philosophy. Highly is said that there are tools which we just automatically reach out to and use and VR research is beginning to support this idea and the binoculars are tools mm -hmm. they're like extensions of us yeah. and children just flock to them and fight over them and I, I think it's lovely thank you thank you sorry, question there is it monetized? are these free? Um, yeah. So the experiences are free. So yeah, both of that. them are just free, open 24-7, you can always... Uh, because you mentioned client, and I'm just wondering, like, who's the, who's the client for thing? Just the National Park. The, okay, there. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, the, the, yeah, they're the client so, for the... So it's funded by tax dollars, basically. Yeah. I like that. That's brilliant. Look, it was a tax dollars. So I have a one... one Make a question to all of you. Uh, just you know, comment on what happened in the young. The, the audience here is a mixture of people from like the uh, Catholic Institutes, public conferences. I mean, you need to make ends meet. You, you, you know, someone has to pay people for your work. I mean, someone pays me for my work, but it's kind of a different business. And you're using material that we are uh, kind of producing and working on in the Catholic Institutes. So, how is it good? I mean, are all communications smooth and uh, there's no kind of real problems in getting the archaeologists to supply data and museums? To, you know, give you access to their holdings, you know what? Are there any issues that we need to be aware of and have to work on? Are you asking all of us or just me? Yes, the first, the first. <laughs> I have a plan at work, like I get to do all these things that I love to do, and like yeah. I said, like, oh, I was so excited to fly my drone, and like, mm -hmm. then it's just so much fun, like, and just showing you behind the scenes how much is happening when we're doing this, because it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's a lot to have happened, but, um, I mean, of course there's, uh, not always, like, there's always some conflict sometimes with 
But we had we had uh, this great work with Kagan. I mean, this was always it's always fresh because uh, we are always working in kind of the, the rhyming thing of never ending. When he had the opportunity to do something like this and you kind of jump from the from the trenches and do something fun. But of course, this was done on we had a set amount of money. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is what we can pay. We cannot extend this. This kind of amount. Uh, then we are actually adding on this project. So now there are two tasks, we have mm -hmm. actually the side tasks that have been now it is granted on me because I went back to the trenches mm -hmm. and have the opportunity. But uh, and, and there were some we work up because one of the pictures you showed they were about the boots, how many are they, how mm -hmm. how do they look and, and I had I'm a historian, I'm not so I had to send the images back to uh, yeah. to the archaeologist and she said this and that and uh, to change some of the, of the doors. Yeah, I remember specifically mm -hmm. the houses, like because I had the uh, I had the door on one side, yes. and then I got feedback. No, no, the door should be on this side. So <laughs> I had to go change everything with my model. Yeah. And, yeah. So, and the problem there was the references is from the archaeologists to begin with were yeah. so good, <laughs> and so they start to work with that those, but then we have to change it mm -hmm. because they're not correct. So there were things to go jump back and And actually, one of the Vikings just to jump from that and take the Maybe the time, but uh, some of the Viking clothes. I had after all just saying, "Oh no, these are twelfth century clothes." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows. Yeah. <laughs> really, really, really important. Yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can pretty much echo what everybody's talking, saying. Uh, it's it's been a, a exercise in patience and communication, <laughs> and uh, from uh, everywhere from you know my bosses down to me to my contact at the at the museum at the at the, the, the Grant Institute, uh, you know, everybody's eager to do everything, and sometimes it just comes a push saying, you know, you really do have to make a 3D model of a road, drop this project for a while, <laughs> and, and you know, so, so it's, it's usually we go over, you know, over our time, but we do set the bar like we only build this amount. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a constant balancing act, uh, and also just you know. Uh, assuming that the client knows, you know, the, the risk is running that, you know, you hope that the people that you are servicing are at your technological level, but usually they're not. Uh, and then thinking that I know all the terminology that they're using, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a constant uh, back and forth ping pong. You use the word that I think is really important for. It's Sorry? You use the word servicing? Yeah. And that's, to me, that's a service. Yeah. You know that you're providing a service, and it's not necessarily about making money from it. Because when I first came up with this idea for Snorriscope, I thought how do we take what you have and, and add a layer to it. I'm coming here from humanities and adaptation studies. I've got no experience in any of this, except I'm interested and enthusiastic. And I can say this is a service. I'm not going to, you know, if you if you find a way to monetize it later, that's great. But I see it as a service. Um, and I think that's a really interesting word to use. Yeah. But it's in the public space, so it should be a service. I mean, if, it, if, it's, a, if it's a private subscription service, then it's a totally different thing. But uh, for these public projects, it's absolutely... Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. Alan, you, know, you wanted me to answer that question Yes. I, I had a, um, a graph of digital heritage and it failed for very stupid reasons, so I wrote a chapter on the difficulties of digital heritage, which relates to grants. And I would like to read that chapter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's very painfully close to my heart. But the book is on difficult heritage. But I, I think I also will talk about digital humanities and so. Sorry, <laughs> digital humanities. <laughs> and so, please stand up. Please stand up. Please stand up. Please stand up. Join them. Uh, I can hear you better. Okay. Um, one thing one can do is offer a premium service, that you have a base product, and then people are astounded and inspired by it, and then you optionally add some features to it. Mm -hmm. So for working between humanities and the government and so forth, that might be one option. But but thank you also for talking about XR. I forgot to mention, and I took the slide off, but XR has this potential, WebXR, OpenXR, of doing everything in the browser, so people don't have to download things. So that's really important. That was all. That was yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, thank you all.
to think about and work with, but the next item on the agenda is to open this door and go outside and I hope heaven awaits us.